Here we'll learn general principles of anesthesia and the drugs that we use as general anesthetics. Start a table. Denote that there are three simple phases of general anesthesia. Phase one is induction, phase two is maintenance, and phase three is recovery, also known as emergence. Alternatively, we can categorize anesthesia based on the depth of anesthesia with the following four stages. Show the depths as follows. Starting most superficially, stage one is analgesia, a loss of pain, also called conscious sedation. Stage two is disinhibition or excitement, also known as the delirium stage. During this stage, patients experience amnesia and reflexes are enhanced. They may display irregular respirations and potentially combative behavior. Note that patients typically progress through this stage to stage three. Stage three is surgical anesthesia. This is the stage in which the patient is unconscious and is ready for surgery. Stage four is medullary depression, which is undesirable. So indicate that our goal is to reach stage three and avoid stage four. Now let's learn some general principles of anesthesia. Start with some key definitions. First, lipophilicity. Write that the lipid solubility of a drug directly relates to its potency. Show that drugs with high lipophilicity more readily cross neuronal membranes and thus have increased potency. They reach their target receptors more quickly than drugs with poor lipophilicity. Now mean alveolar concentration, the MAC or MAC. Indicate that the MAC is the alveolar concentration of a drug that prevents movement in 50% of patients. Now let's show that MAC and potency are inversely proportional. Potency is 1 over MAC. Thus show that as the MAC decreases, the smaller the MAC, the potency increases, the greater the potency. Next, the blood gas partition coefficient. Indicate that it defines the solubility of a gas in blood and the rate of induction and recovery. It compares the amount of drug in one milliliter of blood to the amount of drug in one milliliter of alveolar gas. Let's generate a diagram to understand this concept. Draw lungs, vasculature, and a brain. Show that in the case of a poorly soluble gas where there's a low blood gas partition coefficient, the drug travels into the alveoli, enters the blood where it's poorly soluble, thus increasing the partial pressure of the drug because it doesn't dissolve in the blood, and this forces it out of the blood and into the brain more easily. Write that poor solubility results in increased pressure, which speeds brain saturation and decreases the onset time of the gas. Conversely, show that in the case of a highly soluble drug, where there's a high blood gas partition coefficient, the drug passes into the alveoli and then dissolves into the blood. It has a high solubility, so it takes longer for the partial pressure to build which forces the drug to move into the brain more slowly. Write that high solubility results in decreased pressure, which slows brain saturation and delays the onset time of the gas. Now indicate that there are two types of general anesthetic agents, inhaled, also known as volatile, and intravenous. Let's begin with the inhaled anesthetics. As we've shown, inhaled anesthetics enter the body and form an equilibrium between the alveoli, blood, and tissues within the body. Note that inhaled anesthetics differ from other drugs because they're absorbed and eliminated through the same organ, the lungs. Review our notes for a list of the inhaled agents, but indicate that we can recognize them in part by how they end in fluorine, except for halothane and nitrous oxide. First, as a general rule, the inhaled anesthetics cause myocardial depression, respiratory depression, postoperative nausea with potential vomiting, decreased cerebral metabolic rate and increased cerebral blood flow, which can increase intracranial pressure. For halothane, think of hepatotoxicity. This is rare and is thought to occur through a reactive metabolite that either produces direct toxicity or indirect toxic immune-mediated responses. And also catecholamine sensitivity. In the setting of catecholamines, halothane and isoflurane are known to cause cardiac arrhythmia. For methoxyflurane, and also possibly enflurane and sevoflurane, think of nephrotoxicity. This can occur in prolonged exposure. For enflurane, think of epileptogenicity. It can cause spike wave activity on EEG and result in muscle twitching. Indicate nitrous oxide, NO, which is often referred to as laughing gas because it produces a mild euphoria. 
it serves as a great review of the general principles we introduced at the beginning. Indicate that of the inhaled agents, it has the highest MAC, so it has the lowest potency, and it has a fast onset due to a low blood gas partition coefficient. Importantly, it produces marked analgesia and amnesia, and it has the smallest effect on blood pressure reduction and respiratory depression. From a toxicity standpoint, know that prolonged exposure can inhibit vitamin B12 and thus produce spinal cord degeneration, called subacute combined degeneration, damage to the dorsal columns of the spinal cord. Indicate that sevoflurane is the least pungent of the agents, it's sweet smelling, whereas enflurane, isoflurane, and desflurane are known to be pungent agents with airway irritation and spasm. Before we move on to the intravenous agents, it's important to note that anesthetics can trigger a serious reaction called malignant hyperthermia. Malignant hyperthermia is a hypermetabolic crisis that can be fatal. Indicate that a key trigger can be the combination of inhaled anesthetics and neuromuscular blockade, especially succinylcholine. Symptoms and signs include rapid onset of hyperthermia, muscle rigidity, hypertension, and tachycardia. Labs can show hyperkalemia and acidosis. We follow creatine kinase, CK levels, and urine myoglobin levels as markers of muscle injury. We treat it with dantrolene, which is also used to treat neuroleptic malignant syndrome because it's a direct-acting skeletal muscle relaxant. And we use cooling and supportive care. Finally, indicate genetic susceptibilities as causes, including ranadine receptor, RYR1 mutations, and mutations in genes that encode skeletal muscle L-type calcium channels. Now let's turn to the intravenous agents. We'll address their mechanism and specific notes about their actions and effects. Indicate that propofol potentiates the effects of the GABA-A receptor. Remember that GABA is an inhibitory neurotransmitter. Indicate that it's an antiemetic, which helps prevent postoperative nausea. It can produce marked hypotension through reduction in peripheral vascular resistance, and thus it can cause cerebral hypoperfusion. Indicate that it produces a rapid onset in recovery of consciousness due to its lipophilicity and its ability to rapidly redistribute into fat stores. Finally, indicate propofol infusion syndrome. The complexities of this syndrome are beyond our scope here, but as a simple heuristic, consider that Propofol can cause various toxicities through varying mechanisms. Short-term high doses can cause metabolic acidosis from mitochondrial uncoupling. Prolonged infusions can interfere with fatty acid oxidation. High doses can cause rhabdomyolysis. And the redistribution into fat cells can produce hypertriglyceridemia. Next, indicate thiopentol and methohexitol. Then etomidate and then midazolam. Show that all of these medications share the same mechanism of action as propofol. They potentiate GABA-A receptors. Thiopentol and methohexitol are barbiturates. Indicate that like propofol, they are highly lipid soluble, so they have a rapid onset. Indicate that they are respiratory and circulatory depressants and promote decreased cerebral blood flow. Thus, they decrease intracranial pressure. Indicate that atomidate also produces rapid onset and recovery. Notably, indicate that it's non-analgesic. It does not have pain-suppressing properties. Midazolam is a benzodiazepine. Accordingly, indicate that it has slower onset and longer duration of action with greater risk of postoperative respiratory depression. Make note that flumazenil is a benzodiazepine receptor antagonist that can rapidly help reverse the effects of midazolam. Note that flumazenil can cause seizures, so it's used with caution. Now, ketamine. Write that it's an NMDA receptor antagonist. Indicate that it can produce a dissociative anesthesia with preserved consciousness, but the patient experiences catatonia, analgesia, and amnesia. Unfortunately, note that possible emergence reactions are common with psychotic, sometimes injurious behaviors. Also note that it's a cardiovascular stimulant, so it can produce increased intracranial pressure. Lastly, indicate that dexmedetomidine is a centrally acting alpha-2 adrenergic agonist that is 
used to help provide analgesia and hypnotic effects in order to reduce the required doses of other medications. Note that opioids are often used to help with pain suppression in anesthesia, especially when a general anesthetic cannot be safely administered. We discuss them in detail elsewhere. This concludes our diagram.